Mr. Chair, I move we approve the consent calendar as you presented. Second. Commissioner Yes. Commissioner Yes. Commissioner Yes. Uh, there are no uh, public hearings, so then moving forward, uh, under 40.00, these are some items for discussion and deliberation. The first one of those is 40.01. It's an order setting fee rates for existing fees in accordance with section 211.02 sub E of the codified ordinance of Jackson County. This will be our order number 150-14. Mr. Jordan. Yeah, Mr. Chair, in this case, order number by statute 203.115 allows counties to re-establish fees semi-annually and it's been more than six months since a fee adjustment has been established. In accordance with Chapter 211 of the codified ordinances, the county has completed a comprehensive analysis of the cost of providing services. Uh, that comprehensive analysis was reviewed with the board in a public work session previous to this meeting. Um, in this case, as a result of that analysis, this is an order setting fee rates for existing fees in accordance with Section 211.02 sub E of the codified ordinances of Jackson County, as you referenced. Uh, if adopted, these fees will go into effect on July 23rd of 2014. Uh, Mr. Chair, during your work session, you did uh, have some questions about some of the fees that we provided follow-up information to the board on them prepared to respond to those if you like. I've also asked the department directors for which departments you've had questions about fees to be here today. And I asked our county auditor to be here uh, just because we recently performed a comprehensive audit of our fee setting process in case the board has any questions. And I do recommend your approval. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen, <clears throat> rather long, lengthy uh, work sessions on this. So. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, we, we, we did talk about this a lot, and I had some concerns. Uh, the questions I had, uh, Danny did some research and answered it with, you know, and so I was satisfied with that. Um, it, as you know, many of the fees that we have are, I would say, mandated by the state. We have to charge building uh, permit fees. Uh, I was unhappy with, uh, with some of the fee increases. But the option is, if we don't raise the fees, we spread that cost amongst all of the citizens. We cannot just decide we're not going to perform a fee such as a, uh, I mean, an inspection such as electrical inspection or a, uh, a plan review. So, uh, so the options are: we keep the fees where we are, we spread the, the cost out to all the member, all the citizens, or we uh, we we do put the burden on the person that has the advantage of that development. Now, as I understand it, we still do subsidize, especially the development department, um, to what the $2 million, $1.2 million, something like that, Danny, so that uh, uh, per year, so that we're not charging, the, 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 I guess what I'm saying is the public is sharing in the cost somewhat to that department. But the, the, the prior year it was around $1.2 million, this year it's around $700,000. Anyway, that's my input on this. Okay. Commissioner? You know, I looked at, every time I look at the new fees that are being proposed, it's something we've never had before. And one of them is the $10 animal shelter. Oh, hold on just a second. Uh, Commissioner, these are for current fees that are already oh, established. The new ones yet. My apologies. Yeah, this is okay. The current fees, yeah. I'll save it for the Okay. Uh, just echoing uh, Commissioner Rasher's uh, concerns, we did have quite a good discussion. And as you know, we're trying to do what we can to foster economic development within the county the best that we can in creating a climate for businesses that may want to expand their businesses here or maybe those even who may want to move into the area. We recognize that that can be definitely a hindrance uh, or it has, comes into the equation when one is figuring on to do either one of those things. So we, we looked at those. What I'd like to do is I'd like to ask uh, Eric, our, uh, our uh, internal audit uh, manager, to come up, if you would, please. And would you go through just quickly the process that you and your department did uh, in ascertaining uh, fees? Uh, and and as, if folks don't know, we, uh, I think Danny mentioned this, and I know he's mentioned it other times before, that uh, in, in many departments, with the exclusion of the airport, Fair Expo and parks, which are enterprise, uh, uh, the 
departments that can actually make a profit, if you will, quote unquote. The rest of our departments are not allowed to. They're allowed to, they're allowed to charge up to not exceeding the cost to perform that duty, whatever it is we're charging a fee for. In some cases, as you look at these, and the fees are on our public and public record, in some of those cases we, we charge full 100% of the, of the costs associated with that particular function. In other cases, we charge a very small amount uh, for different reasons. But Eric, would you come up and explain the process that uh, you and your folks went through uh, when, you, when you were here? You reviewed the fee sitting process. Certainly. So to give a little identify yourself. Uh, my name is Eric Kivak. I'm the county auditor. To give a little background on the process, in 1988, management consultant company was brought in to study the fee setting process and to make some recommendations as to how fees should be set. They basically looked at it and said there's five different cost categories that need to be taken into consideration. You have the cost of the building that you're in in which you're providing this service, your fixed assets that you use to provide the service, your general overhead costs, plus your indirect costs, and the direct time spent providing that service. There was an initial assumption made in their process that basically said, and they use the term, to back up a little bit to explain, they use the term productive hours. Now there's what's called total paid hours, which is 2080. 52 weeks a year times 40 hours a week is your total paid hours. And then if you subtract out time that's paid where employees are not work for holidays, vacation, sick time, uh, mandated break times, that brings you down to about 1628 hours. So they started calculating all our costs based on the fact that an employee is being productive for those 1,628 hours. One of the main things we found is that in today's modern office environment, people are being you know, productive but not directly productive in the sense that if you're in a factory line, you're building widgets for those 1,628 hours. If you're in a modern organization like ours, you're a lot of time is spent going to meetings, answering various different questions, keeping up with the professional certification training requirements, all these other types of hours which actually reduce the amount of hours that you are building widgets for. So, so thinking back to it mathematically, if you take a cost and we're to divide that by 1628, it is going to be, you know, down here. But if you subtract out the time that employees are at work but not building widgets, they're going to meetings, trainings, strategic planning sessions, and whatnot, and you come up with, say, 1,500 hours, so you divide that same cost by a lower amount, your cost per unit rises up to here. So that was one of the main findings of our work. So we recommended that the departments actually study the hours that people are spent directly building widgets versus doing the other services that allow them to build widgets. And that was one big impact, so the departments had to recalculate costs based on that. We also looked at direct and indirect within a department. So for example, if you have in your widget factory 10 people on the factory floor building widgets, and one person whose job it is is to order supplies, receive the supplies, do all the billings, you have to look at how, you know, when calculating your cost of the widget, do you divide it by the time of the 10 people or the 11 people? And we found that sometimes they were dividing it based upon the cost of 11 people, when really only 10 people are directly building widgets. The cost of that 11th person should kind of be added on to those 10 to cost and divided by the 10 people. So I'm not sure if I'm going into a little bit too much background detail, but those are some of the basic findings that we found. We recommend that all departments review the portion of their people that are directly building widgets versus indirectly helping the widget builders. Those would be your administrative support people, your management people, supervisors, those types of folks. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Chair, could I have just one clarification? Uh, not to the audit, but just to the fee process in general. Uh, essentially, um, you know, Eric speaks of numbers as an auditor, and, and it, auditors like to have things be an exact science. Uh, the truth is that um, anyone can challenge a county fee uh, in, in our courts, and since 1988, when the consultant company came in and subsequently then we uh, implemented our fee structure, we have been challenged three times. And, and you know, generally the counties had to explain the methodology, as Eric just mentioned today, and each of those three cases, our methodology withstood the test of the court, and uh, we were pre 
unveiled in the, in the um, challenge. You know, essentially, there are, you know there are a lot of fees, and I, I say this because <clears throat> there are some fees that we set by ordinance that are based on the time, indirect, direct cost, the things that Eric mentioned, those are the things um, that are included in this existing fees, but also included in calculation for new fees, which you'll have a public hearing on. Um, <clears throat> but there are fees that don't take into account those particular items that Eric's talking about, they don't necessarily go through our fee ordinance. Those include fees that are set by the state that we're required to charge, or the federal government, or by contract, by an intergovernmental agreement with agencies that we have. For example, for public health, when you know we have to put people on a sliding scale because they don't qualify for insurance and those types of things. Um, but there are some fees that we charge where we just recover the cost, and we have to be able to support what the cost is. We don't have to have all of the detail. And that's an example of that is what we're going to discuss next. So I just wanted you and the public to understand that there are, this is actually, you know, and I get accused of saying this frequently, but this is complex because there are different laws that govern the fees differently depending on which fee we're talking about. Okay, thank you. So again, thank you, Eric. Uh, and I, I did want to bring Eric up because I was impressed with uh, as, going through this when we had our, our audit committee meetings and through that is that we're really trying to do it exactly the way we're supposed to be doing it and we don't want to overcharge uh, make sure that we, or we want to make sure that that VA is not paying for fee B so anyway thank you it's it's a complicated and it's obviously very political I mean anytime you're getting up and you're explaining why you're charging the public fees dollars for anything I mean it, Nobody's happy. Nobody raises his hand. Oh, good. Let me. Let me. I want to pay. I want to pay. So, with that explanation, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, if we approve or disapprove this after that fact, if the public uh, wants to review those fees, what is the process for? Them? They can request a copy of the documents that support the the fee uh, time study. Uh, well, I, I mean, just, no, just the list of fees that we. Have. It's a request for a public. Uh, record as well. So they come to the commissioner's office, make that public request there. Yes. Okay. Any further comments? M Mr. Chair, let me also say just um, these are already fees that exist and, and in this case some of the fees went down in cost because of the reason that Eric talked about and some of the fees went up in cost. This is not just an increase in fees, this is an adjustment for the actual cost. So there's a certain number of fees that went down because of those adjustments and a certain number of fees that went up because of those adjustments. Okay. Okay, just covered by this gonna say just Okay. Motion please. Mr. Chair, I move the number 151-14. Uh is that right? The next item is 40.04. It's an order, an order authorizing a public health accreditation board application with the public health accreditation board. It's our order number 152 Once again, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Chair, my understanding is that you previously had this before the board and moved it uh, to a later date for consideration. We had some questions, and my understanding is our staff have adequately provided you information. To answer those specific questions, the Public Health Accreditation Board is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving and protecting the health of the public by advancing the quality and performance of tribal, state, local, and territorial public health departments. This is a voluntary national accreditation program which measures the performance of the health department against a set of nationally recognized practice focus and evidence based standards. Accreditation provides a framework for a health department to identify performance improvement opportunities, improve management, develop leadership, and improve its relationship with the community. Jackson County uh, Health and Human Services wishes to apply electronically for national accreditation in order to meet the nationally accepted standards of quality improvement for local public health departments. Citizens will benefit in the accreditation um, in that the accreditation promotes high performance and continuous quality improvement. 
clarifies the public expectation of health departments, increases the visibility and public awareness of government public health, leads to greater public trust and increased health department credibility, ultimately creates hopefully a stronger constituency for public health funding and infrastructure, recognizes high performers that meet nationally accepted standards of quality improvement, illustrates health department accountability to the public and policymakers, and provides a competitive advantage to obtaining grant funding. This item, as I said, was on your July 9th agenda. The board did ask to postpone it this day. Let's get more time to study the issue. The term of the application would be up on acceptance and be for a period of five years. It's a one-time upfront expense of $31,800. And I do recommend your approval. Okay, thank you. Uh, as, as Danny stated, this was uh, on, the, on the agenda before, and uh, Commissioner Asher asked for additional time to do some, some additional research. And, and done that. So with that, John, I'm going to uh, turn it over uh, to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, um, I did ask for the extension uh, here a couple weeks ago based on that I was contacted by a number of citizens that were concerned about this uh, relationship. Uh, particularly, they were concerned about a woman named Claire Coleman, uh, who used to be with Planned Parenthood and her association with one of the strategic partners. So I've had the time to do a lot of research on this. Um, I, some of the information that I received from the public I found to be false, and that Claire Coleman was associated with Planned Parenthood, but she has no association with, uh, with one of the strategic partners. And let me back up this Public Health Accreditation Board, PHAB, they have 13 strategic partners, and these partners give them advice on things. Um, but Claire Coleman has had no relationship with any of those strategic partners and is not on any board of those strategic partners, uh, is not a staff member of any of those. Uh, one of those partners, AMCHP, which is the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs, did, did have two articles about her. One, they reported that she was uh, designated as the organization or the, the head of an organization that is not one of the strategic partners. Uh, the other um, article that they had done on her was she did a report on, uh, I did, this is interesting, it was things I didn't know about, did a report on, uh, on uh, Title 10, which is a public law, 91-572. It was enacted in 1970, and the idea of that was to uh, benefit uh, low-income women and educate them on pregnancy. Um, in the article that Claire Coleman reported on was just the fact that in case people didn't know, Title X funded clinics would give education to young mothers on diabetes, obesity, and smoking. What effect that had on the unborn. It had nothing to do with abortion. So I did call, and bear with me here, I did call AMCHP uh, back in Washington, D.C. I did talk to Nora on the staff. She says they do not promote and they do not deal with abortion. Their focus is on children that are already born with special needs, uh, such as autism, uh, hearing problems, birth defects, and uh, maternal fetal infant mortality prevention. So this is how they can prevent the death of, of children of unborn. Uh, I did look up uh, all of the board members. There's 18 board members uh, on that organization, most of them, and you can look them up too. I just Googled it. Uh, most of them are pediatricians or pediatric nurses. Uh, and I'll move just a little bit. The, the Public Health Accreditation Board does not dictate any service that the health department should provide, and I want to emphasize that. Um, Jackson Bowers had contacted them, uh, talked to Kay Bender, and, uh, and I'm going to quote from the email I saw back from her. We don't have anything to do with abortions at all. We have absolutely no plans to get into that in the future. Um, I, I did do a little research on uh, what the main focus of the Public Health Accreditation Board is, and their primary uh, function, as I can tell, is they're concerned about the population in a particular county and how many health workers we have. You know, they want to make sure to be accredited that we have enough health workers to handle a, pop a, pop a population. That's their main focus. Uh, and, Weighing all these things out, uh, and, and really I spent six hours one day working on this, and uh, I don't see any conflict there that's detrimental to the county, and 
with that said, I think we should move forward on becoming accredited. Okay. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Mr. Breidenthal, any comments? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I do have some concern with uh, government being uh, accredited through nonprofits in general. I have seen these types of problems arise through the fire industry with ISO specifically, and where you have nonprofits dictating uh, insurance rates through communities, and they can dictate the amount of profit they make on an annual basis based on the insurance rate they can do, and that they, uh, the standard they apply to that department. So I, I do have concern over that, and where I see this becoming troublesome in the future is potentially the accreditation board can start dictating how many employees the county should have in this particular situation to be able to provide health services for the, the county. Otherwise, we wouldn't have necessarily the accreditation. I've also raised concerns on the fact that I don't see, I haven't heard any sufficient documentation at this point in time on what grants we would be available for and how this would benefit us in the specifics that way. So with LAC, this is a very new organization. Uh, I don't see a lot of uh, tenure here yet. So I don't really understand what the true impact in the long term is going to be, nor if they have a track record to demonstrate that true impact. So I, I can't support it at this point in time, but and that's pretty much why I have concern over long term this nonprofit having say on how we're going to run our health department locally. Okay, thank you for your comments. Uh, I'll just tell uh, you if you were heard or were here when I when this first came up, I'm going to stick by what I said at that time. But you've been doing some following research. John had sent something stuff over. He says you ought to take a look at this, blah blah. And and anybody who knows John knows his details, but. Um, uh, I still feel that as I looked at the, the check boxes on the accreditation, I, everything I saw was very, very positive. Uh, it gives us, uh, what we're trying to do is be continuously improving in every one of our departments uh, for the benefit of the citizens of Jackson County, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, it's one of the things that I think I'm most proud about when I look around and see our departments in action. Uh, so with that, my, my position hasn't changed. Mr. Chair, may I just answer a few questions that Commissioner Brian Paul brought up just so that the public is aware. Regarding the example of insurance, the County uh, Health and Human Services Department doesn't prescribe to insurance providers whatsoever for insurance. The county self-insured, and I think it would be pretty much impossible for anyone to dictate to the county what we decide to insure ourselves out besides our actuarial. Um, so there is pro very little to no likelihood that our insurance rates for the delivery of the services that we're being accredited for would be affected by this, as opposed to fire or you know police and those types of things who, in some jurisdictions, do seek out and purchase those types of insurances. So I understand the argument. In terms of dictating the number of employees, what dictates the number of employees is the intergovernmental agreements we have with the agencies of the state or federal government, or in our case also with uh, uh, non-profit uh, coordinated care organizations provide certain level of funding and they do dictate to us what our staffing levels should be in terms of meeting the service level. So um, I think there's little to no risk whatsoever of uh, the accreditation affecting or dictating was the word that was used, what our staffing levels will be. Well, I appreciate the work on, on both my fellow commissioners on this and taking a look at this. I know it's not something that just came across and we just check it off and say yes. Uh, recommendation by staff, let's do it. Uh, so again, I appreciate uh, both uh, my, my commissioners for doing that. So with that, I'm looking for a motion. Um, Mr. Chair, I would like to make one other comment, uh, if I could. Um, in the email I saw to Jackson Bowers from uh, Kay Bender, she did uh, reiterate that the uh, accreditation board does not dictate any service to health department. Uh, with that in mind, I move we approve order 152-14. Second. Second for, for vote, right. I understand. Okay, thank you. Yes. Commissioner Grantwell? No. Commissioner Yes.